But if you, brethren, <clears throat> bite and devour one another, take care lest you be, be consumed used. by one another. <clears throat> and therefore, my title today of my message, Turning Spiritual Freedom into Warfare. <clears throat> now, they weren't biting and devour just to make a point. You know, like <clears throat> sometimes <clears throat> somebody might bite you, so to speak, to tell you to back off. They weren't biting just to give a warning. They were biting to do what? what what's the text say? To devour, to devour and consume. consume. Now, let me tell you what consume is. Johnny, did you eat all of your peas? Did you eat all your peas? I don't see it on the plate. All right, Johnny, take them out of your pocket. <laughs> Did you consume, bite, devour, to consume? I suppose contextually we might call that cannibalism. Fair? Spiritual cannibalism. They're biting and devouring one another, flesh, to what? To consume. This was the church. This was the early church. <clears throat> Within the church, there was cannibalism, spiritual cannibalism going on. Paul makes a very bold statement with this, doesn't he? I mean, that's, that's out there. When he says baiting and devouring to consume, <clears throat> that's, that's pretty out there. That's the early church. And actually, the church is not, has not become much better. Because it still has the same factions in it. Law versus grace. This whole warfare... In Acts 15 and Galatians 2 <clears throat> was law versus grace. They're n you can't, they don't compromise. You never compromise grace with law. They're incompatible. <clears throat> Let's have a word of prayer. We're going to come back and take a look at this lesson this morning under three points. I get a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's the great teacher of the Word of God. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality, evidence of carnality, operation flesh, sin nature, is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue or overt sins, but there's evidence of it because the Holy Spirit has been quenched and grieved. If your spirit knows anything about the Holy Spirit's ministry, it will know that. Quenching, grieving are very strong words, and they're spirit words. So what do you do? <clears throat> you confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you, 1 John 1, 9. <clears throat> and it puts you back into spirituality where the Holy Spirit can teach you the truth. So let's do business, church people. Let's do business. I give you privacy to confess your personal sins and let the Holy Spirit teach us truth about turning spiritual freedom into warfare. <clears throat> should never be done in a church. And so, our Father, we thank you today for all that have come our way by automobile and Internet. <clears throat> Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson, for we are still at war with law and grace. <clears throat> We're still at war. It's war over the concept of spiritual freedom. There can be none in the law. The law is bondage. It was designed to be bondage. It was to show you that if you fail in one, you fail in all. 
James 2.10. So encourage our hearts today, Father, to understand that we, we've been set free and we should live in the power of that freedom. And there's a lot of responsibility in the church to it. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul is trying to wake the church up to personal responsibility of how we're taking care of one another. You're not taking care of one another very well if you're biting devour to consume. We're not doing well. And so the writer, Paul, is battling this out in the book of Galatians. If you know anything about the order of the books, then the order of these, this book is very important. By the way, James was having the same problem, and he was struggling with it in his own personal life as the pastor of this church. And, I mean, he spends, the book of James could well be the book about the sins of the tongue and how damaging it is to a church. Because he writes about it in every chapter but one. We've been talking about that on Wednesday night. Look at verse 13 at the top of your paper. You were called, air is passive indicative, at aorist tense is a point in time, divorced for time, referring to your salvation. Passive voice, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. The indicati indicative is the mood of reality. This is a reality whether you accept it or not. If you accept the fact that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, when you believe it, you're saved. <clears throat> the aorist tense is that point that you believed it, you were saved. The passive voice means you were saved outside of yourself. Romans 1.16 says that, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. See, that's outside you. That's a passive voice, and the indicative is the mood of reality. Now the re mood of reality is now you've been set free in verse 1. Christ has set you free. It was for freedom that Christ sets you free. Why would you go back to the law? The law puts you in bondage. As soon as you go back to the law on any occasion for any reason, you've put yourself under an umbrella that says if you violate one, you violate them all. See, you don't do that when you first John 1, 9. You confess one sin, it takes care of it all. That's grace. That's not law. That's grace. Law to hold you accountable for everything you did. To offend in one is to be guilty of all. It wasn't designed to free you. It was Christ that came to free you. Christ came to free you. That's, that's verse 1. Christ came to set you free. It was for freedom. And so the entire book is, why would you go back to the law? Why do you go back to law in any sense of the word? You were called to epi plus the locative of divine purpose. You were called to what reason? You were called to freedom, like verse 1. Brethren, church age believers, only do not turn your freedom. See, that's volitional. Do not turn. Do not turn. That's volitional. Listen, it's volitional and instructive. If you were driving, let's say you let your boy drive, Billy. You got your driver's license yet? No, that'll be a day. Looking forward to that day, aren't you, son? I know, boy, I was too. I got mine up 14 as a farmer. No, I did. I got it at 14. I was a farmer. Couldn't go anywhere with it, but I still had it. <clears throat> but just because I got a driver's license and I didn't get a car, I went through college without a car. Kids are so spoiled today, <clears throat> mine included. Only do not turn your freedom. Do not turn your freedom. Do not turn your freedom. That's volitional. And it's responsible. If, you were, if, if the young man was driving 
and Billy was trying to give him instruction where to go, <clears throat> and then there would be a light, don't turn there, don't turn there. No, 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 don't turn. Turn around. It is the next left. See, so when, he's, when he says this, only do not turn your freedom, it's volitional and instructive. Instructional, instructional, right? There's a lesson to be learned here. Only do not turn your freedom into ice plus the accusative of divine purpose. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But this Allah is, is contrary or contrast, but, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment, so pay attention to it, through dia plus the genitive of means, but rather through the means of love, serve, notice that word, that word, doleo, that's a word for slave or servant. You know, and you know why it's used for both of them? Because it's all about mental attitude of authority. I don't care if you're a servant or a slave. Your mental attitude towards the positions of authority, the chain of command for a Christian on the job, it is Jesus Christ, it is your boss, it is you, and what stands between you and your boss is a job description that pays your salary. <clears throat> and he has this in mind with Dia plus the genitive. Through love, serve. Through love, serve. That's to have your attitude in the right place, to have your mind set on the system of that chain of command. Now watch this. Present active imperative, that's a command. A present active imperative is a command. Second person plural. You know what that means? Not one person in this con congregation is exempt from this command. Not one person in this church or a Christian, listen to me, anywhere in the world to this message today is exempt from this. Not one. So let's see what he said again. In contrast, through love, serve one another. It's a command. Now, when we read on to the next verses, we see what they were doing, what they were doing with opportunities of the flesh, with opportunities of the flesh. They were fighting among themselves. They were biting and devouring one itself theologically. This was over doctrinal issues. Acts, the 15th chapter, is how this comes out. <clears throat> this is the reason this book is here. Present active imperative. And, and, and what are we doing? One another. See that word? One another. Who is he talking to? The church. What church? Well, he's talking to what is called the Southern Galatia churches, technically. Now, the Allah, the word but, Allah, contrast, what's he contrasting? Now, pay attention because you don't pay attention well. So pay attention. That word contrast, is, he's, he's put two things over here. Watch that. What's the, what's the one thing over here? Do not turn your freedom into opportunity of the flesh. Boom, that's the one side. Do you see that? We talked about volition and responsibility of instructions. On the contrast, look at this. By means of love, that's the love of God that's been put in your heart at the point of salvation, Romans 5, 5, that is able to function under any circumstance or condition in your life by the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22. There is no circumstance. Listen to me, because you're not going to believe it. So I'm going to have to tell you until you believe it. There is no circumstance in your life, no matter how bad, 
in your mind. If it's a circumstance in your life, the first thing you've got to say, I know it can't be bad because God allowed it. Therefore, it's got to be what? Either that Romans 28, you've already thrown it out. Either all things work together for good or they don't. It's not some. That's the way you live. It's not some things. It's all things. It's not some things. It's all things. Be well, it'd be well worth your effort to get the scriptures right in your soul because it would take a lot of pressure off you if you did it right. <clears throat> and who are we to, what's the answer? What's the antidote to, listen, only do not turn your freedom into opportunities for the flesh, and he's going to describe that in a minute. What's the antidote? If that's the poison in the church, what's the antidote? Please tell me, what's the antidote? It's love. It's the love of God. It's not something you have to conjure up. It's the love of God that's already in your heart, Romans 5.5, 5, that's ready to be addressed in the most impossible circumstances. People are biting and devouring trying to consume your life. Do you understand that? This is not nibbling. This is not nibbling on an ear. This is biting to devour, to consume. It does not get in. Hey, did you see it the other day about this guy who, who, who beat that mountain lion? I mean, I thought I was having a da bad day. You ought to have that on your phone or look at that every day, right? Now, I hope he winds up knowing that God has a purpose for his life, don't you? If he didn't know it going in, he sure ought to know it coming out. <clears throat> But that's, that's called biting and devouring to consume. <clears throat> now let me look at point number one. Paul issues a warning. Shot over the bow. Paul issues a warning with a doctrinal solution regarding turning spiritual freedom into warfare. Biting and devouring to consume to the Southern Galatia churches in our lesson text. In verse 15, he says, now watch, he gives two imperatives. Are you paying, are you paying any attention? There's two. There's two imperatives are the warnings. Here, here's, here, here's one. I already gave you one, right? It was the antidote. I gave you one. Now here's the other one. If, first class condition, if it's true in the apotiphus, it's true in the apotiphus. If it's true in the, then, in the if, it's true in the then. That's a first class condition. If you bite, present active indicative, and chi adjunctive, that means that the two verbs are locked. He's doing one to do the other. If you bite and devour, it means that you're being bit to devour it's just a matter of getting you at a place where you surrender so they can eat you. And what was interesting about this man with a bobcat, that every time the animal in his mind says, I think he's got me, he went, no, he hasn't. And it made a difference. It makes a difference to the animal and the prey. It's a matter how you fight. In the spiritual warfare, you have to fight spiritually. It's flesh against spirit. It's the opportunity of flesh fighting the opportunity of the spirit. And the spirit always wins. Always. 
always wins. If you fight back in a flash, if you win, it won't be a win. The good thing about that mountain lion, he didn't leave, he did not leave there until it was dead. You know, I love that. I don't want to meet this guy again. Whatever tactics he, he did not have and I did, he'll be one up on me the next time. A.T. <clears throat> Robinson, who is a classical Greek guy, <clears throat> almost anybody that studies the Greek language runs across this man. <clears throat> it was a phenomenally bright guy. And when he was talking on this very subject, bite, devour, and consume. He made an illustration of two, of two snakes swallowing each by the tail until both were dead. Now, as you have no winners. <laughs> That's what was happening to the church, he said, and rightly so. That's exactly what was happening to the church. And if you can visualize that concept, you can probably see the dilemma that Paul is writing about. This conflict arose from doctrinal disputes between the legalistic liberty party. It's funny how the devil uses the same terms. The legalist liberty party and the grace liberty party, and they were miles apart within the church. The first attack upon the spiritual freedom of the Christian church was in the first century A.D. with the church of Jerusalem. It was an attack upon the gospel of grace salvation in Acts 15, 1. They said that you, you don't have salvation if you believe that Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead. You believe that. You still have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Paul says that's not true. I've been out on mission trips, and I've seen hundreds of people saved as Gentiles, by the same message the Jews got saved by. And we didn't require anything except, do you believe? That was the Jerusalem conference in Acts 15, 1 and 5, and it was decreed by grace should be the message of the gospel. The gospel should be a message of grace. In verse 11, we believe we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they, the Jew and the Gentile. He comes back in the third chapter of Galatians and covers that verse 24 through the end of the chapter really well. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor female, rich or poor, uh, free or slave. We are one in Christ. We are one in Christ. We are one. And Paul says that the one thing that makes us, listen to me, he says the one thing that makes us all one is God's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself, but as gift of God, not of works, lest these demand boast. Takes it out of man's control and puts it in God's control. If you believe, you receive. That's a powerful idea. Must never waver on that. Must never compromise on that. Never. I've told you a hundred times, if not more, from this pulpit, number one thing I fought all the years I've been here is grace. As the number one thing Paul fought. And thank goodness for it because he wrote a lot on it. It is the fight of fights. The second thing, Satan is the adversary of Christ in the church. He's the adversary. In 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, <coughs> it's interesting how, eight, how verse 8 says, Satan, like a roaring lion, on the prowl, you know what it says? Seeking to what? Devour. A roaring lion seeking prey to devour. 
You know, where, you know what his field of hunt is? Do you know what field is his favorite field to hunt? You would think it would be the last place. It is the church. Why? Because it's the only place with a message. And what church would that be? It would be the Grace Church because they're the only one that's got a true message. And so, boy, did Paul get it. 2 Corinthians 11, chapter, you want to read about a foreign mission trip? Read that one. Most of us would never go on a second missionary trip if we had that trip. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 11. Satan is the adversary of Christ in the church. In verse 9, it gives you, it gives you the antidote. 1 Peter 5, 8 gives you the problem. Verse 9 gives you the solution. You know what he says? <laughs> nah. I say you don't know this. Your greatest adversary, on your way home today, the devil is going to prowl over you. He's going to, he's going to be after you because you're part of a, do, a doctrinal grace church. He's going to be all over you, and if not today, tomorrow, he is your adversary, people. He is your adversary, and he prowls on your field. Not plow. Prowl. I don't want you to hide. Your adversary, your adversary considers you prey. Now, how are you going to beat him? You're going to meet him on the path on the way home or at home or away from home. You got to, listen, says he prowls. <laughs> you know what that means? It means he's on the hunt. He don't prowl for people that he's already captured. Captured. He prowls on those who he hasn't captured. Verse 9 tells you what your antidote is. How do you beat them? It is amazing to me that you didn't look that up. It's amazing to me. Because you're going to be prey. If you think he's not going to prowl today... You're mistaken. If you think he's not, listen, he prowls, more, the longer the church is in existence, the more he prowls because he knows what his timetable is, whether you do or not. And you better well understand verse 9 because the only way you're going to beat him is in verse 9. You will never beat him anywhere but in verse 9. You know what the first word is? Resist. I'm going to talk about that Tuesday night at Bible study on Joseph, how he resisted. <clears throat> but how do you resist? You're supposed to resist. You go like, I guess so. If a mountain lion jumps down on me, I got to do something. That, you know, <laughs> resist. Resist is a common, a common, woo, I got to do something. But what's the something? When the, because it's a spiritual, you're not going to, he's not going to jump out like physically. It's spiritual warfare. So what's he tell you? Resist him how? Firm in your, firm. That's a fighting term. Take your stance, exactly what this guy did fighting the mountain lion. He faced him off. If he'd have ran, that thing had been over. He chose to fight. That's firm. Resist, firm. Face, face the enemy, because you can beat him. Firm in your faith. What's it say, Ernie? Knowing what? You know what I'm saying? Look, you better do it because let me tell you, it's going on everywhere in the world. Satan's on the prowl everywhere. 
Going to Belarus? Belarus? Yeah. Guess who's going to be there when you get there? Guess who's going to be there? And we're not worried one moment about it. Not one moment. Because we know how to resist. We know how to take our stand, look them right in the face and beat them. They'll never get us by fear because my faith will beat them, right? Only reason he's a roaring lion is to get you into fear because if he can get you into fear, you're out of faith. You face him down. You attack him by faith, and he's, he's beat. He's beat. Beat every time. Beat every time. Satan learned this strategy in the Garden of Eden. He learned this strategy in the Garden of Eden in what was called the cool Bible study. That's a common word today, isn't it? Cool. Everything's cool. Everything's cool except when it gets cold. Everything's cool. Everything's cool. How's it going? Cool. I don't know what that means. <clears throat> I have no idea, but it's a conversational piece because everybody says it's cool. I don't know if that means it's hot or cold. That may be just a lukewarm term. I don't know. But, <laughs> but I know in Genesis, the third chapter, in the eighth verse, it said they went to the cool Bible study. And guess who attended it? Satan as he always does, in disguise. Listen, he always dresses up like, like Halloween. He always is in disguise. If it's Christmas, he dresses up like Santa Claus. If it's Easter, he dresses like a bunny. <coughs> but he's always in disguise. But he's always in disguise in the season. Do you not know that? If it's in the summertime that he's got... The swimming suit that, well, you know. Now, I don't care what you wear. Don't care if you wear it or not. I'm just saying that he plays the game. Listen, his deal is disguise, deceit. That's on your part. And he's really good. He's really good at disguise and deceit. I mean, he is a great movie star. He learns his lines and he can play them out. <coughs> He's really, he would get, he would get all the awards. <coughs> he would get so tired of getting awards, people go, I'm not even going because he'll get them. Kind of like Alabama football. Everybody's tired of winning. Can you believe that? Tired of winning. What is wrong with us? Tired of winning. Jeez. And so what's he do? He distorts it. He disguises deceits to do what? Distort the truth. Destroy. Dis, distort. Distort. The truth of the Word of God. <clears throat> he did it with Peter, inside disciple. One of the three disciples, inner cycle team. The inner cycle team. <coughs> Peter got him. Right? Matthew, the 16th chapter, 21 through 23. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Whoo. That's pretty strong language. That's pretty strong language. Do you know what? We talk about the essence of God a lot. You ever thought about the essence of Satan? <laughs> yeah, he does. He, he bro he, and listen, he boasts about it. He brags about his essence. And so Jesus thought he would declare it to you so that you would understand what the true essence of Satan is. Listen to what he said. This is what Jesus, this is what Jesus said. He said, here's the essence of Satan. He does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. None. El Zippo. None. None. 
man, can you imagine that? I've never met anybody who had no truth in them. Have you ever met anybody in your life? Now, I've been around qu quite a while. I can't, I can't ever remember. I met some shady characters, but even them, they, they would go like, well, you know, there's, there's loyalty among thieves. I was like, what? But listen, Satan, there is no, not a, not a bit of truth in him. What, what, whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature or essence. He's a liar and a father of lies. He's the master of lies. And you know what he can't stand? The truth. The truth of the word of God. Jesus pulled a sword. Listen, you pull a sword of the truth of the word of God out of, out of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, you pull that sword, which is the truth of the word of God, and he runs like a scalded cat. He can't stand the truth. He cannot stand it. John 8, 44 and you know what the truth represents to him? Listen, John 14, 6. See, what he hates about truth is what it represents. It represents to him, it represents John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, he hates those three things. That's everything he does not stand for. He's the epitome of death, not life. Lying, not truth, right? And the list goes on. He's just the opposite. You know that, don't you? <coughs> Three. Throughout the history of Christianity, <coughs> it has <coughs> this war has been fought <coughs> against doctrinal division of one body and one mind. <coughs> In 1 Corinthians... Second chapter, verse 16, Paul writes to the Corinthians, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? You know, that, that almost sounds like the book of Job, doesn't it? That's how God talked to Job at the end. But we, church age believers, but we have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Here's Ephesians 2, 14 and 16. For he himself is our peace. That's Romans 5, 1. For he himself, he alone, is our peace, peace with God, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier dividing wall by abolishing his flesh the enmity, one of 13 charges, which is the law of commandment contained in ordinances. There, there's the power of the law to condemn that in himself he might make two into one new man to bring the Gentiles and the Jews, to bring the un unbeliever in Christ into the church, no matter whether it's Jew or Gentile, male or female, uh, poor or rich, whatever. Listen, that in himself, in himself, he might bring, make two into one new man, thus establishing peace, Establishing a beachhead of peace. A be Here's peace. You come to the cross, I give you peace. Peace with God. When you believe that, your, your life becomes a beachhead for, for the peace of God for others. Do you understand that? That's what he's talking about. Make, do it, thus establishing peace, a beachhead for peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he talks about the importance of the one body, of the one mind, of the one people that have been born again. <clears throat> and if you think that this is new to us, for example, in the first century, the Jerusalem church, they fought this. And they eventually split. In the fourth century, Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire. That's one way to solve the problem, ain't it? That was one way. But you still had factions inside it. 
that goes on to the 11th century when Roman Catholicism split into Eastern Orthodox. And then it rolls on into the 16th century where you have the Protestant Reformation. And w w listen, after the Protestant Reformation, that which has started in the first century, and we have battled through every, and I just hit the highlights, battled all the way through. Here we are battling. Christianity today is divided in so many factions called denominations, it's pathetic. There is no such thing as denominations. Those are doctrinal warfares that are splitting the church of being one body and of one mind. After the Protestant Reformation, the Christian church has not been in any sense monotheistic. It has been divided up into doctrinal factions known as denominations. Remember the danger of Robert's illustration of the two snakes, because in the end, they all die. And remember the analogy of the snake in the Garden of Eden. Apart from the doctrinal teaching of grace, I may be the last voice in the whole wide world of my generation, but I'm going to preach it until I die. Because I'm going to tell you something, what I've discovered. It is the one doctrine that can bring the unification back. We have all walked out of denominations. Everybody in this room has walked out of some kind of denomination and have gathered here under one banner of grace, the doctrine of grace. And we are wide open to allow, to embrace anybody who wants to come in under the banner of grace. Apart from the doctrine of grace, Christian New Covenant Church has lost its unity of one church, one mind, and one voice of grace salvation. And you should listen to the, we'll have a report the second hour on a mission report. You've heard Rick come back off from the mission field with one preaching, one message, grace. And that is a voice that's been unheard. And listen, those who have never heard it, when they hear it, it breaks their soul like yours and mine. It breaks it wide open into the worship of God. It's the most amazing thing. It wasn't my life. It opened the doors of my soul to worship God in ways I could have never imagined. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and there is no division among you, but you be made complete in the same mind, in the same judgment. It is the responsibility of every generation of believers to fight the spiritual warfare of spiritual freedom, of grace. Because we are reminded it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Idea law works. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace bestowed upon us in the most magnificent work of Christ on the cross. As agonizing as terrible to the human mind it could have been, from the divine standpoint of heaven, it was a marvelous act of grace. And it is because of that that we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. We applaud you, Father, for your true character and essence that will provide such a way not only to get into the kingdom, but to maintain a relationship with you in it. I pray today, Father, as we take the offering that we have pledged with our hearts and not just our minds. We have pledged with our hearts the proportion that we should give. And as stewards of that, that we are, as a church body of authority, very sensitive about how this money is used to further the kingdom of God with the message of grace. <clears throat> For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name.
Amen.